<laughs> and that was really what I exposed with unjust enrichment, the fact that these men were working for the companies, the company was paying the Japanese government two, two yen per day per man to use our prisoners, and they were in turn supposed to pay our prisoners Japanese soldiers' pay, and that's what they didn't do. So if anyone likes to calculate what they owe them in back wages, plus 60 years interest, plus a little workman's comp thrown in, sure. it would be more than the dollar a day they got from our government for missed meals. Within six months of Pearl Harbor, the entire army of the Pacific was either killed or captured. So we had uh, about 20, more than 20,000 Americans as prisoners of war, and quite frankly, the Japanese never expected that number of the enemy to surrender. They didn't know what to do with them. They, they couldn't adequately feed them and certainly didn't want to. They you know, were just going to feed them enough to keep them alive enough to work. And if somebody died, no problem. There was more when he came, where he came from. And eventually, there were 36,000 Americans in Japanese military prison camps, all of which were on Japanese company property, with very few exceptions. When they came home, many of them did not get anything. There was a troop ship that came into San Francisco, and here were these prisoners of war with other returning veterans. And here is the band on the dock, and the mayor, and families. They were kept on board until after dark. They were not allowed off the ship, and they were taken to Letterman Hospital and confined there for quite a while. Uh, but they, they, they weren't allowed you know, a big welcome homecoming. In some ways, this happened to a lot of people. And uh, the gag order I talked about earlier, where our government uh, uh, and it was not uniformly applied. Only some men on their way home were made to sign this. But they were told, no radio interviews, no newspaper interviews, don't write your memoirs, don't show any photographs that you might have uh, without permission from the military. And if you do, you'll spend the rest of your life in Leavenworth. And you know, this absolutely put the clamp on me. There was one fellow who was in a bar in Detroit and he was mouthing off about the Japanese. And a couple of FBI men came and tapped him on the shoulder and took him outside and reminded him that he wasn't supposed to be speaking. You use a term in the book, unjust enrichment. De define that for us. The Zaibatsu were like the cartel. They were a, a group of uh, powerful, rich Japanese companies that had interlocking directorates. And there would be people from Mitsui sitting on Mitsubishi's board and whatnot, and they controlled the industries of Japan. Back during the time of the uh, International Military Tribunal for the Far East, the Tokyo War Crimes Trial, that there was any sense among the, uh, even the American prosecutors that they were guilty, but for the fact there was not enough documents? Or yes. was it strictly political? No, well, Donahai said they regret, he used the word regretfully. We had to notify Mr. Keenan. He and one other investigator were, were really uh, the lead ones looking for enough documentation to indict these CEOs because they knew Mitsui had loaned the Japanese government billions of dollars for the prosecution of the war. And of course, they were aware um, and they had enough depositions from American uh, POWs that our people had been forced to work and war work for the Japanese and that they had profited from this because they had war quotas that they had to meet. And one, one uh, memorandum I have in my book, they had to make monthly reports to Tokyo, to the Prisoner of War Management Bureau. And this one Mitsui company manager said, oh, our production has never been so good and, and, as it has been since we got these white prisoners. That was it, Donahai said, that we were so regretted we could not indict them. They didn't meet the level 
They, we couldn't find paperwork to rise to the level of being involved in the planning and prosecution of the war, which was the Class A criterion. But he said to me, I always felt that they could have and should have been put on trial for mistreatment of prisoners of war, which occurred on their property. Right, I think MacArthur thought it was politically very expedient to just let these people do their thing and um, because initially we were quite punitive and um, uh, we were not willing to give a lot of aid to the Japanese companies. We were sort of letting them stew in their juice for a while and then we decided yes we had to make them our bulwark against communism because the Communist Party had a very big foothold among the workers of Japan mm -hmm. and we were so worried the Russians had come into Manchuria, they had come into Korea and we were afraid that they were going to somehow get control of a lot of the Japanese people and so that was our goal. It was a Cold War expedient, I think, as much as anything else. Hirohito, you talked a little mm -hmm. bit about him. Clearly, uh, he became hands-off from a directive in Washington. Ordered, and MacArthur agreed with that. MacArthur also did not want to put the emperor on the witness stand or implicate him in the trials, make him the central figure of responsibility for everything that happened. Because after all, every command, everything was done in the emperor's name, and that is why this execution order that I got hold of uh, was introduced, as it turned out, in the trial with no comment, because anybody who would cross-examine the British soldier who found that slightly burned copy in his old camp in Taiwan. Uh, By the way, I understand. Would you explain to the audience what that was? That was, was really, uh, there was a policy that was established very early on by the Japanese military that any commandant of any POW camp, including civilian internment camps, if he thought he was going to have to surrender to the enemy, he was to kill all the prisoners first, or all the civilians first. And I guess the idea was very simple, no witnesses, no war crime. You agree with Truman's decision to draft the atomic bomb, based on your research? Um, yes, because they knew that it was going to take our ultimate weapon to make the Japanese surrender, even the militants would see that the destruction was so terrible uh, that, you know, they would have to stop. And also Truman was aware of this order, this directive. I call it an execution order, but I've been corrected by a, uh, an historian who, who documented a lot about the the uh, Tokyo trials and has written the definitive volumes on. And he says it was not a military order, it doesn't have a military order number on it, but it was a clarification of the original directive. That's what that piece of paper was. But Linda, we can't thank you enough. Oh, it's my pleasure really to be back in Chautauqua County and to be able to go through Buffalo again. It's just very nice, but I am so impressed with what you've done in just five years? Well, he says five years you've created all of this? It's really wonderful. It's, it's such a tribute to wanting to, to preserve history.